Yes. All right, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Can folks hear me at the back? A little. Uh, I'll have to try and talk loud. Okay, there we go. All right, uh, so today we're going to talk about uh, stupendous day tricks and <laughs> what's new about today is that uh, there's going to be a lot more around using recipes for some of the things that we're going to show. So for, actually maybe before we get, uh, get into this, how many people were in the session that I gave yesterday? Uh, how many people were not in the session that I gave yesterday? Oh, a couple. A couple. Okay, so my name is Martin Anderson Quotes. I'm a senior solutions engineer at Acquia. I'm also on the Talking Drupal podcast. I've done a bunch of Drupal and sort of, you know, adjacent technology certifications. On all of these social platforms and Drupal platforms, you can find me as ManClue, and I'm also a track lead in the Drupal Starshot, now Drupal CMS initiative as the um, event recipe leads. So that's going to be very relevant to what we're going to talk about today. Huge thank you to all of the sponsors who made it possible for us to have this amazing conference this week. And let's dive into talking about the, the joys and complexities of working with time zones. Uh, so definitely lots of issues. This is one of those areas that can be kind of a minefield, especially for anything that gets even remotely technical. So as soon as you start managing dates and times that, that involve things like you know, time zones and recurring events, it can get very complicated very fast and um, yeah, not so easy. Um, and then you have technologies that layer on and do things that think that they're being helpful and oftentimes are not. So, you know, uh, Excel often is the butt of jokes for, you know, the, the ways that it gets things hilariously wrong. Hopefully in Drupal we can do a little better than that. So today we're going to talk about the events recipe. Uh, those of you in the session yesterday will have seen a little bit of that, as well as the events calendar. But we're also going to show being able to associate those events with locations um, and also using a locations recipe for that, as well as an events registration recipe to easily add registration to your events. Those recipes are going to bring in a variety of modules, smart date being um, probably the best known of those, um, a lesser known one called date augmenter API. So oftentimes in Drupal, if you're doing things like uh, deduplicating the event output, and we'll sort of see some examples of what that looks like, people are using a date formatter for that. If they want to do things like have add to calendar links, they're using a date formatter for that. If they want to do things like make sure the output is in like associated press style, they're using formatters for that. But the problem then becomes you have to choose which single one of those things you want to do. And the whole idea of the date augmenter API is to make it more of a plugin system so that you can pick which of those that you need and put them all together. So uh, we're going to see a couple of those today, date content being one, add to, content, add to calendar being one. If we feel really adventurous and we have time at the end, we can try the associated press style one because I haven't actually tested with this demo. Uh, full calendar review being sort of the interactive calendar we're going to see and the registration module as, as what's going to provide the uh, registration as part of that events registration recipe. There are also some things built into these recipes. Um, when it actually eventually gets into like Acquia or Drupal CMS, um, these may be more part of the base recipe than, than sort of explicitly part of the events recipe, but add content by bundle is something that provides sort of a nice um, intuitive prompt on the different uh, display interfaces to say, go ahead and add one, a new one of these. Obviously, path auto and meta tag probably don't need much introduction. Um, and then uh, and inline entity form is something that we're going to sort of weave in to, to sort of demonstrate how that can really help your content editors have a more intuitive experience as well. The location module is built around modules like, or sorry, the location recipe is built around modules like address, geocoder, geofield, and leaflet. Obviously, there are some alternatives out there, and if you prefer those, then you probably don't want to use the locations recipe, but you... If you have that strong preference, you probably know enough how to build that on your own. Uh, I'm going to call this a fresh install of Drupal 11. It is 11.0.1. .1. It has some things in there that, uh, so number one, you know, if I'm using a site myself, I'm basically always using, using the Jin admin theme, uh, which brings in Jin toolbar as a dependency. I think I've heard that Drupal CMS is likely to use Jin as its default admin theme, which I think is a great decision. 
There are a couple of modules that are built into what we're going to see. May not be super obvious that I'm using them, but key save is a way that let, lets me from the keyboard save a lot of different forms. And for something like the demo today, where we're going to cover a lot of ground, it makes my life easier. And no type defaults, just setting up content types as I create them with defaults that I think are the way things should be set up. Uh, for the sake of time, I've also pre-installed GeoCoder and put in a Google Maps API key. For two reasons, it's going to save me some time, and also nobody's going to see the API key that I use. <laughs> All right, so first off, let's go ahead and install our event system, again, on our fresh install of Drupal 11. Uh, we want to have an easy-to-use date widget that includes an all-day checkbox. We want it to do intelligent deduplication in date output, and we want it to have add to calendar links. So for that, let's go ahead and switch over to our Drupal 11 site, uh, do some quick validation. It only has the article and basic page as our content types. So we can now go into iTerm and install a recipe. So it's going to go ahead, do all of the fun things. Obviously, eventually, uh, we'll have this working in Project Browser. But for now, we can go back. Oh, the other thing we should do, have to remember to do every time I install a recipe for right now is to also rebuild the cache. So let's go ahead and do that. And now if we refresh the page, now we can see we have an event system there. When we go in, so this is that add, add content by bundle. So basically when you're displaying any kind of content, you can have a prompt that says, hey, why don't you add another one? So instead of content authors having to remember that there's a menu that they can go to to find where to add those things, they can go to the, where the place is listed and see like, oh yeah, I can add one right there. So if we go ahead and create our first event, test event, we can set that in the future. Um, maybe what we want to do is also set an all day one. So let's say sometime out in the future, make that all day running for a week. And now we can go ahead and save that. And so we can see how it's, it's doing some deduplication right off the bat. So normally with Drupal core date, date time fields or date time range fields, it would have both the date and the time for both the start and the end, even though it happens on the same date. So it's not really the way we would write that in sort of natural English. For the all day events, it's doing an OK job, but it's more complicated because the default format includes the day of the week, which sort of makes it a little trickier to deduplicate. So something we can, we can do to sort of make that more effective is if we go into our uh, actually, let's go here to content types, edit our display for events, and say instead of the default format, let's use this one that's a little more compact. Update that and save it. And now when we come back here, uh, ooh, oh, it's because what did I do? Uh, teaser. Oh, that, oh, right. So if we actually click through, then we'll see it. So uh, on the uh, detail page now, we can see that it's um, you know still doing basically as well on the single day event, but the all day one, we can see it's doing a much, much nicer job of that. And now, so we can see our add calendar links, and we can see that those are working as well in terms of pushing all of that. Uh, event date information through to the um, destination calendar. So, um, yep, so that's sort of the, the base first case. Again, this is kind of a, a recap of yesterday, so apologies for uh, those people that are seeing it for the second time. But now let's look at some of the additional capabilities that we can use thanks to the events system, or the events recipes. So let's go back here and let's go events calendar. Go ahead and apply that one. Let's go ahead and also do, oop, while we're here, let's go keep, go events locations and apply that one. And let's also at the same time Go ahead and apply our registration recipe. And then let's just do a quick refresh of the cache. All right. Are these yours? Or are these uh, 
So I think the answer to your question is yes to both. So these are, are recipes that I've created, but they are posted as contrib projects. So they are things that you can sort of download and start using. Um, a couple of them have some funky things around like Composer detecting the right requirement of core. So I'm sort of trying to work with Drum and some folks around getting that smoothed out. But for now, at the very least, you can sort of like uh, clone the repo into your recipes folder, you know, add the dependencies and, and run the recipe and it should work as intended. All right, so now if we go back into our event, we should at the bottom see that we have the ability to set a registration type. It actually sets this as the default, so now if we create any new events, it'll, it'll have registration set up and turned on by default. Uh, but if we go back for this one, we can see that it has um, this registration. You can say I'm registering for myself or for somebody else. Um, it's showing this one because I'm logged in as an, as an admin, like a normal user wouldn't see that. But there's probably a variety of ways that this registration system could be like more refined, but we're still like... I think there's not even an alpha release yet for that recipe. So it's like super early days, and if people have thoughts about how to make this better, would love to get any feedback on that. Uh, that being said, if we go into our back to our upcoming events, notice that we now have a calendar tab in here. And we can see in here we've got the event that we've created displayed in the calendar, but it's also interactive, so we can drag and drop between days. We can go within the day, drag and drop to change the actual time. And we can even drag and drop to change the duration of this. And if we click through to the event, we can see that it has actually updated the database with you know, those changes that we made. It wasn't just within the calendar widget. All right, and then the last one that we talked about was being able to associate a location. So let's go ahead actually and create a location first. So call it Aqua Boston. United States, Oops, 53 State Street, let's save that. And now we can go ahead. So notice, because we had the geocoder set up, it's automatically uh, plotting that in a map for us. If we go back to our event, now we can see there's this field where we can associate that. And then when we save that, it's displayed right on our node. So, in practice, we could have like a smaller map there. There's obviously a variety of different ways that potentially this could you know, be refined some more. In most cases, I would probably prefer to use something like inline entity form as the widget, but I haven't built that into the recipe because it doesn't have a stable release, so it doesn't have security coverage. But you know, again, these are the kinds of things that are going to be evolving, hopefully, as we get closer and closer to the eventual launch of Drupal CMS. All right. Um, I think we're doing okay for time, so maybe what I'll do before we move on any further, does anybody have any questions that we can answer before we get into some some things that are getting more into the configuration? Yes. Yeah, I mean, to their credit, they do have a an issue stating what they see as the blockers to a stable release, but I agree. There's, I mean, especially considering it is pretty widely used, it's one of those things that, that should just... Yeah, yeah, it, it needs a stable release for sure. Yes? Uh, have you considered the uh, full calendar block uh, versus the view module because of the way it um, does AJAX loading and it's more performant? Yeah, that's a great question. So the question, and I probably should have <laughs> repeated the other question for the recording, but uh, the, the question just now was, uh, have I considered the full calendar block instead of full calendar view? for the calendar recipe because of the fact that it can load data via AJAX. And yes, is the simple answer. Um, and in, in fact, at one point, the developer of both of those modules, because it is the same maintainer, had actually marked a full calendar view as sort of like minimally maintained. I think it might even still be uh, marked as that. But the last time I checked, there wasn't actually any evidence that full calendar block was actually you know, more frequently maintained. In fact, there has been a very recent release for full calendar view, which is one of the reasons why I just went ahead and used that because I did have, number one, an existing integration, so it became a very quick path to do. Um, but I am still open to the idea of, of switching paths. I, I personally really like the idea of being able to have different displays for views and ha linking them up together as tabs because I feel like that provides a really good and intuitive way for end users to be able to sort of navigate between those different you know, uh, displays of the data, but um, I'm not certainly not married to that. I've even been looking at a calendar view as something that's sort of less JavaScript based. 
Uh, I feel like something that's more Drupal native, potentially there's, op there's benefits around having more control over like accessibility. I know for a few years back there were some accessibility issues in full calendar itself that were not easy, you know, in a Drupal site to, to be able to fix. So uh, definitely open to, to other solutions there. And, you know, if, if anybody has one that, you know, you think is worthy of consideration, I'm happy to get feedback on that as well. Another question. Is calendar responsive? Is the calendar responsive is the question. Uh, I think so, but I feel like calendars in general are, are just like not generally a good experience on the phone. Like oftentimes they'll have like a dot or something on a day and then you have to sort of like click into that to be able to see any useful information. Um, in my personal, period, uh, my personal opinion, I feel like that calendar view is most useful as more of a management tool. So that idea of being able to drag and drop things between dates and times. Um, but I feel like in terms of actually displaying it to users, it's often way more useful as a list. Yeah. yeah. All right. Uh, I think we'll go ahead and jump into our next use case here. So let's suppose we want to build on this infrastructure that we have and now build out something that is less, you know, out of the box in terms of what we get with those recipes. So we want to build something that can display weekly concerts. And for each of those weekly concerts, we want to be able to show um, one or more artists, each of which will have an image and a bio, uh, a description for the concerts, and also to have it repeat on Tuesdays and Fridays. So as we go back into our system here, let's enable another module. So SmartDate comes with its own uh, SmartDate recurring. So we can install that. We can go back into our fields for the event. And essentially say, let's go ahead and make that recurring. We can use, I think, the defaults for everything else. So let's save that. And now if we go and uh, actually, hmm, I think I actually jumped ahead. Meetups is the one we want to do first. So let's uh, make this our first repeating one. We're going to use the event content type, make it repeating on the second Thursday of each month, we'll display the time zone, and then for each meetup, we want to be able to associate a topic, presenter, and meetup link. All right, so we've already set up the recurring for that. Let's go ahead and also set up the time zone support. So actually, out of the box, SmartDate already has time zone support. It just kind of hides it because not every site needs it, so you just need to change the widget to one that supports time zones. The other thing is, you know, obviously having sort of a um, global user base out of the box. Um, Drupal supports every time zone in the world, but not all sites need to. So you can do things like say, maybe we only want to present our content authors with a subset of all of those. So, so we could say, uh, let's expose Chicago, Denver, um, Los Angeles, and New York as the time zones we want people to be able to use. And save that. And now if we go and create, in this case, a new event, and let's call this our monthly meetups. Uh, let's just set here something in the past. Say that happens at 6 p.m. and runs for two hours. Um, and let's say, notice now that we have this dropdown, we can say it happens monthly. And we can say on the second, Thursday, uh, we can let that run indefinitely, or we could have it run until a specific date or uh, for a number of times. And now we have our time zone. So we could say, let's say that happens in Chicago time zone. So it's generated all of our instances out for, uh, remember when we set enabled recurring, we said how far out it should generate those. So we said for a year, so it's generated a year's worth of these meetups. We have add calendar links for the ones that are in the future because adding something to adding something that's happened in the past to your calendar probably isn't something that most users want to be able to do, but if you want that, you can turn it on. Um, and notice that it's actually outputting the time twice, and that's because of the, the time zone is different from the site default. So um, it makes sense if you know what it's doing, but it's not probably super intuitive for users. Uh, fortunately, that's something that's actually fairly easy to fix. So let's just go back here. So that is in our, um, that's our default time zone, or sorry, uh, default display. What we can do now is if we go into 
our smart date display, we can add the time zone, uh, add a time zone um, token in there to display what it's doing, and that'll make it a little easier for people visiting the site to sort of understand what they're looking at and which, which time actually is more relevant to them. So we just added that, actually maybe before I, I quickly move through there, point out, unlike the sort of uh, date time token that Core uses, that's a single one for both date and time, uh, Smart Date is a little more granular, so you have separate ones for date and time, and you can also have one for time on the hour. And that allows it to sort of have an output that, you know, uh, is more deduplicated and, and does some of those other good things. So now if we go back to here, uh, we can see that it's actually saying, you know, central daylight time or central standard time after it flips over. Um, and so all of that output now should be, you know, clear to your users why it's got those two. Um, and you can also turn off the, um, the output of sort of the uh, site default if you want, but um, you know, I feel like particularly when you get into time zones, it's good to, to be erring on the side of communicating more rather than less in terms of, of what people are, are viewing. All right, uh, so then the last piece is really to be able to have the topic presenter and meetup link. And for that, we're gonna use another one of those uh, date augmenters that we talked about. So let's go here and we've got our date content augmenter. And really what this allows us to do is to create sort of granular pieces of content that we can associate with each of those individual date instances. So if we go back to our uh, display for events, and now we say, let's go back in here. Notice that it has this, this whole section in the widget configuration or formatter configuration, excuse me, for date augmenters. We can turn on the content one, and now we can specify which date content bundles we want to be able to create for this particular um, the field output. So in this case, uh, there's one that's been created by default by the module called session, so we'll go ahead and use that one. And now if we go back to our monthly meetups, refresh the page, we can see we have these links to be able to add session content. So actually, let's go back and do one other thing. So you notice by default, it'll take you to like a separate page where you can fill that out. Uh, that works pretty well if you've got sort of a lot of different fields. But if it's uh, less information that you need to input, and probably, I would hope, for this, a lot of the time that's true, we can do uh, things like open that up in a modal or open it up in the off-screen settings tray. And so let's go ahead and use that. And now if we go ahead and try this again, you can see that it just opens it. I like that experience because I feel like as a content author, you're not sort of moving around all over the place. Uh, it gives you more context. So we've got our topic and our speaker, and I think the other thing that we wanted was a meetup link. So let's go, go ahead and say, um, now what we need to do is go into our date content types, go into session and say manage fields. Let's create a new field and let's call it link. So let's call this uh, meetup. And we can go ahead. Maybe we want to set this up as a default value. Obviously, there's lots of different ways you could do this. Set that there. Uh, maybe we want to alter the display to say we're going to leave that without a label. And now if we go back to our monthly meetups, add session content. Um, maybe there's some guy who keeps talking about smart date all the time. Um, and there's our output uh, associated with the individual date output. And that'll work across different formatters that support um, the um, date augmenter. Adding that to an existing formatter is, is fairly trivial. There's like, I think like seven or eight lines of code that need to be done. But at this point, all of the smart date formatters obviously support it. Uh, I haven't heard of too many others that do. So, um, but if you have your own formatter, it's definitely something you can drop the, uh, the API integration into that. All right, so I think that's our uh, monthly meetups uh, use case. Maybe we'll move on to the next one around concerts, which I already started to introduce. Um, so showing uh, one or more artists with image and bio, having a description for the concert, and having those repeat on Tuesday and Fridays. 
So uh, for this, we're going to go ahead and create another content type. So let's call this concert. Let's save that. Let's go ahead and manage our fields. We'll leave the body. We'll reuse our when field from before. Uh, let's go ahead and say that that can be recurring again. And I think we can leave the rest of the defaults. Um, now let's think a little bit around how we want to organize this. So for artists, I think we probably want to set those up as their own content type because we want them to kind of have their own page where people can, can access the, the right of, about the article directly. So let's go ahead and add another content type for that. So artists, uh, maybe we'll change the title label to name. And save that. And maybe we'll change this to uh, bio. I'd leave it as the body field. I usually like to, unless they need more than one format, to leave just one for simplicity. And then what we can do is, since this is a standard install, I know there's an image field that we can reuse. And normally you would like change where the uh, images go and all those things, maybe even use the media library. But for our demo today, that's probably good. So we've got our artist content type. How do we associate the artist with the individual instance? Well, again, we're going to leverage this system of date content and create a new date content type. So let's go down here, add a date content type. And this, uh, we're just going to call it gig for our demo and say that um, a gig is really going to associate for any particular date. Um, we're going to associate a description. So we're going to give it some formatted text. Uh, let's call this description, formatted text. Again, I'll pick a particular type and we'll say that's fine. And then we also want to create the association with one or more artists. So we'll call that a reference field. We'll call this uh, performed by and we'll pick our content. Say that that can be unlimited and use artists and that should have us pretty close. All right. Now the next thing we, we need to remember to do is to go back to our, let's close out the session, uh, concert and say where it's going to uh, output those. We want to make sure it's going to use the right values uh, that we have here. So for our content, we definitely want to make sure it's using the gig and not the session. We can leave it using the off-screen off settings tray. Let's go ahead and save that, save that, and now we can go ahead and create our first concert. So let's call this Acoustic Afternoons. Let's maybe backdate it a little bit and say it's going to happen 2 p.m. for 90 minutes and have it happen weekly on <coughs> Tuesdays and Fridays. Let's go ahead and save that. and. That's a little less useful. Uh, having it show all of those as a user coming to this page, that's not a great experience. They probably only care about, you know, maybe the one that they caught last week because it was so good, or they want to see, you know, what are the ones that are coming up. So what we can do now, uh, let's see here. Let's go to our display settings and switch from the smart date formatter, which basically outputs everything, to one that's specialized specifically for dealing with recurring dates. Now we have in here some additional uh, options in terms of saying how many in the past should we display, how many upcoming ones should we display, uh, let's do three, and also do we want to sort of have the, the next one output separately so that you can sort of look a little more featured. So um, probably don't need links on the actual rule um, or content, so let's save that. And now we can go back to our display, and that looks a lot more friendly to somebody just coming to the page who wants to catch some, um, some content. So now let's see what the process would look like if we were going to associate an artist here. So we've got our description, uh, we've got our artist field, um, but we run into the same thing that we saw earlier, which is as somebody creating this content, I have to remember to go and create the artist first so that I can use the um, the autocomplete as a way to reference it. So let's 
quickly look at what the pros, how much effort would it take to actually integrate inline entity form. So let's go ahead and set that up. Inline entity form. Save that addition. So that's good. Um, now if we go back to our tab, the concert, we can go to our form display and we can say, oh, no, it's actually in the gig that we need to, to update this. So we go here, perform by, we change it to a complex inline entity form. It's the one I usually use. Um, override the labels is kind of a nice thing. So again, making it more intuitive. So we'll say artist or artists, allow them to select existing one. That's kind of the whole point. And now we can save that. And if we come back to here, close that and reopen it, we can see we have these options. So I can say, uh, add an existing one. Again, that's an autocomplete, but that's not a problem. There are ways that we can improve that. We can talk about that later. Um, but now we have the ability to sort of directly without leave, leading, leaving the form uh, to create a new artist. The only downside uh, to this right now is it's a bit of an ugly form. You know, there's lots of stuff that like usually you wouldn't care if you're just creating that as something referenced by something else. Um, but one of the things that's really cool about Drupal Core that not a lot of people use on a regular basis is this idea of uh, form modes. So in the same way that we have display modes uh, and view modes, you can also set up form modes. And we can create a new one for our content, for our artist. Let's actually call it embedded and save it. And as soon as we've created it, uh, Drupal is actually really helpful and says, here's a link if you want to go ahead and update that embedded a form display specifically for your artist since that's what you said you were creating it for. So now we can take out the ones that most of the time, again, in that sort of embedded creation, we really don't care about, like the defaults are going to be perfectly fine. Uh, oh. uh, going to be perfectly fine uh, pretty much most of the time. So name, image, image and bio are probably the things that we care about in that embedded context. Mm, let's go ahead, uh, go back into here and say for the foam form mode, make sure we're using embedded and update that, save that. And now if we go back to our concert and go to embed here and create a new artist, that's a much more manageable experience, something that's going to be really simple for your users to be able to figure out and use. So let's go ahead and create something in here. So let's create. Uh, this, copy and paste, uh, here we go. So description for the, uh, the actual concert, we will grab a summary for the bio, drop that in here, uh, let's go here, grab an image that I downloaded earlier, give it some alt text because we're good human beings, and then drop in the full bio that we have written up already. So if you go back in here, put that into there, say create the artist, you can see the association there. We could add more if we wanted to, but let's go ahead and save that. And now we can see that it's putting all of that in there. Um, formatting of that is, is okay. It's not terrible, but um, we can probably make that with just a little bit of effort. Uh, looking even a little better. So if we go in here and say um, maybe what we want to do is have this um, reference not just the label but actually show a teaser view of that. Um, so let's go ahead and make that a teaser. Save that. And then for the artist, actually that's that may even be enough. Let's go see so uh, we could probably get rid of the description label, fine tune it a little bit more. Um, but I think that, that actually looks pretty decent you know, out of the box. So the other thing that I wanted to point out here, it looks like there's a lot of links on here, but that's also because as a content author, we have the ability to do all these different things. If we open this up in an incognito window, you can see that a regular user visiting the site only has the add to calendar links and doesn't see any of the other markup. That's, that's really more for the management side of things. All right, um, got 10 minutes more. Uh, there's one that's for meetings. I feel like it's maybe a 
has a lot of duplication in terms of stuff we've seen before. So I think what I'll do is skip over this one, round out my notes, and then that way we've got a little bit more time for questions. So um, what haven't we seen in terms of what we've uh, talked about in our session today? So we only very like lightly scratched the surface of full calendar view. You can do cool things like have it show events in different colors based on like the content type or some kind of like a taxonomy reference field. Uh, so some of those things can be really nice. Uh, entity registration, again, like we barely touched on, but you can have different registration types. You can do things, it's all fieldable too, so you can like collect uh, like food allergies or t-shirt sizes or you know whatever other kind of information you need from the users when they register. If, you, if your use case is more around things like uh, booking a room or like you have a you know, professional masseuse who people want to schedule their time. Uh, there's a module called Bookable Calendar that's probably better suited to that kind of a use case. And then even with the inline entity form, we saw that when we go to select an existing one, it defaults to that autocomplete using something like Entity Browser can provide more of like a visual you know, browse type experience as well. And obviously there's like a whole bunch of different use cases for events and times that you know, we didn't even cover. Um, there is also, uh, you know, f full confession, some smoke and mirrors here. So I did have a couple of core patches uh, applied to make all these things uh, work as smoothly as they did. And also, registration doesn't officially have a, a D11 compatible release. There is an issue open uh, that's there that has a merge request. So I like cloned it down, you know, switched the branch over to uh, to that merge request uh, branch to get it working for our talk today. But hopefully you can see, you know, um, in, I guess, basically a little over a half an hour, we were able to take that fresh install of Drupal, uh, use a small-ish number of modules uh, to create a, a wide variety of capabilities, um, did some fairly complex things, and did all of it just purely in, con in configuration, so, like, no code at all in terms of what we did today. So, um, I will reiterate that I have smart date stickers for anybody that wants them. Um, uh, Manco on the socials, I'll probably post the slides uh, later today and uh, I'll see if I can get it attached to the uh, GovCon session as well, but uh, happy to open up the floor for questions. Yes? Can you show the, uh, excuse me, the mobile display instead of the uh, sure. bar display? Yeah, so well, let's... As far as like uh, scrolling if the stuff's too big or... Concert. Oh, it's the display, not the phone display. So that's. And now if we go back to here, uh, I need to refresh. There you go. So it could look a little better, but. So you got to go ahead and add the new artist. Does it stay with that? Yeah. So the settings stay the same. Um, visually, it could probably, you know, look a little jazzier. Maybe you'd want. Well, it scrolls. It doesn't. Yeah. It's not. It's not broken by any means. Yeah. But yeah. Thanks. Yeah, no problem. Uh, there's another question. Smart date is only part of Starshop. Part of the core soon? Uh, I doubt core. Um, I mean, I feel like that's one of the benefits of Starshot slash Drupal CMS is that we can continue to have uh, modules that can innovate at a faster pace, um, make it easy for people to use those out of the box, um, but they don't necessarily have the same sort of like rigorous constraints around like every, you know, like like formatting of the tests is like up to core standards and some of those things that like can mean issues take literally years to, to get implemented. So, um, yeah. Yes? Does this system you show create nodes for every session or a game? Okay, so I, I'm re just realizing that I'm not doing a great job about repeating the questions for the recording. So the question was, um, does the system that we've seen create nodes for all of the different pieces of content? So the, the answer is that for, for things where we said we were creating content types, yes. So for concerts, for artists, um, for events, those are all, all nodes. 
But things that we set up as the date content, so things that are like um, the gig or the session, the sort of the associated information, those are actually a separate entity type, so not nodes. Uh, any other questions? Uh, it's a question here. Hopefully, moving on, we never have to do migration again. But, but if we have to, I'd have to probably migrate the date related entity type first. So the question was um, for migrations, would you have to migrate into, I think, maybe like core date fields first and then to smart date? Um, or it's just generally what's the path for migrations maybe. So there is uh, some code in smart date that allows for, you know, or helps with the migration from Drupal 7. I get the sense, so like I don't do a lot of <laughs> Drupal 7 migrations myself, so that's like from my standpoint the challenge. So I kind of rely on people who like raise issues and then other people who are actually using them to sort of say, yes, it's our TBC and ready to go in. Um, there is code in there. I get the impression that particularly for recurring events, it could maybe be a little bit better, but um, you know, again, there, there are people working on those things. Uh, the other thing that you can do, depending on exactly what you need, uh, there, there is a drush command that can easily move your, your date data from like a core date field into smart date. So if for whatever reason you just decided for the sake of the migration, let's just push it all into core date fields and then at some point later, um, move that into a smart date field so that we can use some of the other, you know, uh, whiz bang features, then that's also a path that you could use. Uh, any other questions? So we've got three minutes, but also happy to give people three minutes back if everybody is, oh, here we go. I noticed that there's no add, um, like, what was it, uh, gig uh, behind the screen um, to, once you've added one, is that just because you set a limit of one for gig or something, or is that just how it works out as a box? Oh, in terms of sort of, so I think the question is, for a specific date instance, is there a reason you can't add more than one? Um, it's a good question. I, I guess in my mind, the sort of one-to-one one -one relationship probably made the most sense, but if, if for whatever reason people were like, it, we would love to be able to, to do multiple, probably you could. The other thing you could do would be to sort of say, I'm going to make the, um, the date content kind of a wrapper and then use it as sort of an entity association and then have the multiple in there is, is kind of a workaround that you could do that wouldn't add it a whole ton of complexity either. Um, any other questions? <laughs> so if you use a recipe like this, are you thinking about this as something that you kind of do once, you import the recipe, you configure it, you have this site, but then as you continue to develop it and add all of your fancy smart date stuff, like, are you thinking at all about forward compatibility at this point? Because nobody knows, right? How this is going to work. I was curious what you thought. So the question was really about forward compatibility of sort of the events recipe and how a site that uses, let's say, the events recipe today, how they would get the benefits of some of the things that might be evolving in the space. Um, so certainly to the extent that some of those changes and improvements are um, directly put into smart date, the, the site that has applied the, uh, the events recipe will certainly be able to make use of those, but might, might need to know to opt into, you know, you know um, adopting a new configuration setting or something like that. Um, in terms of updates to the recipe that that do cool new things. The simple answer is that, that the site that installs the events recipe, I have to stop saying installs, that applies the event recipe today doesn't get the benefit of changes that happen to that uh, recipe downstream. Um, that's just the way recipes are designed. They're meant as like a kicking off point and then at, at that point, it's your site configuration and you own it. Um. <laughs> do, you, do you get the feeling that recipes could be used to functionality that is closed? I mean, so the question is, is could recipes be a, a good way to sell certain functionality? I think there's a bunch of ways that, that 
Um, I, as much as recipes, I think, are in some ways pitched as something for people new to Drupal to be able to test out content, I absolutely think it's, it's a potential way to say, here's something cool, like if, if you go into a pitch to, to somebody that's doing a, a comparison of like, we want to buy a, a new website, tell us why we should you know, use one that you're going to build. If you can stand up something that's very close to what they need, that, that's very robust because you've been able to, to use recipes to leverage a ton of existing work, I think that's absolutely going to help you sell it. The other, the other potential that I kind of think would be super cool about recipes is um, an idea that I think it was somebody from Lullabot talked to me about years ago, this idea of almost like build first development. So when, somebody, when you're talking to a customer in discovery and they say, oh, well, we need a website that's going to do these 10 different things, rather than taking that and turning that into a spreadsheet and then like going line by line and, and you know, column by column, with them through that and you know like we've all seen customers that like are not technical and their eyes glaze over about halfway through and then they just say like yeah it's all fine and then once they actually see it they're like no this doesn't you know this isn't at all what we need you can actually use recipes to stitch together a bunch of those elements and say here's what a a you know event system could like look like out of the box and they might be like that looks amazing or they might be like Actually, now that I see that, that's not at all what we need, and here's why. And I feel like sometimes it could even be incredibly useful, even as almost like a straw man, you know, so, so they can help surface some of those ways that, that they actually have, you know, sort of weird needs that, that they didn't know how to articulate earlier on. <laughs> right? <laughs> right? So, yeah, so those are uh, some of the reasons why I'm, I'm super stoked about recipes. I see that we're actually slightly over time. If, if somebody has like one more burning question, we can get in, but also happy to like not be standing between you guys in lunch. So I think we're good. All right. Thanks, everyone.